Britain drew the attention of Rome and British Celts sailed over the Channel to aid their Gaulish cousins in their war against Rome. Julius Caesar's first invasion of Britain AD 43 was no more than a skirmish, but by the reign of Hadrian AD 117 to 138, Rome had established rule in what is now England and Wales. Caledonia, Scotland, however remained independent and was cut off by war. Hadrian's Wall, stretching coast to coast along the line of the modern-day border between England and Scotland. Although the historian Tacitus records that Agricola, the governor of Britain, entertained an exiled Hibernian chieftain and considered invading Hibernia, the Romans never came to ancient Ireland. Let's now look at Roman Britain. We go to ancient London first. Established as a staging post for the invasion force crossing over from Gaul, despite its Celtic name, there is no evidence for a pre-Roman settlement of any importance at Londonham. London. The Celtic capital at the time was Colchester. But within 17 years of Emperor Claudius' invasion of Britain, the historian Tacitus speaks of Londonum as, crowded with traders. A hive of commerce. Roman Londonum was founded at the tidal limit and lowest bridging point on the Thames River, where the clay bowl of the estuary, meets a gravel layer of strata. Sufficient footing for a permanent bridge across the river. The Cardo thus continued up from the original London Bridge, a timber construction, to the summit of Corn Hill, which was crowned by an impressive 500-foot basilica. Although there are hints of a Hippodamian grid at work, the original settlement was burned down during Queen Boudicca's revolt in AD 60-61. By the end of the first century AD, a stone gastrum was erected at Cripplegate. The walls were unearthed during excavation in 1949 and found to be four feet thick. The presence of a military fort in a civilian city is not surprising. Lugdunum, Leong, in Gaul also played host to a permanent garrison of 1,000 men. It is likely then that Londonham also housed a permanent garrison that protected the trade and commerce in the bustling port, and held the gateway to Britain open for the continuing campaigns against the Celts in Caledonia, Scotland, in the 1st and 2nd centuries AD. Londonham is similar to Ostia. An originally Hippodamian nucleus expands haphazardly over time, and is eventually enclosed by a city wall. A coin of Emperor Commodus, who reigned from AD 180 to 92, was discovered beneath the foundations of the wall which puts the walling of the city to the late 1st century AD. The gastrum was also walled up within the city in the northwest corner at this time. The buildings of note in Roman London are the bath complex at the Coal Exchange, Mark C along the river wall, the Mithraeum, Mark D, and the Basilica, Mark B on Wheeler's plan. The recently discovered Mithraeum is located along the banks of the Thames, and dates to AD 180. The temple was constructed of brick. It is an interesting building because it actually conforms to the plans of a basilica rather than a temple. But it was nonetheless dedicated to the Persian god Mithras, a soldier's god. Although busts of Serapis, Minerva, Mercury and Bacchus were also discovered, which has led many to suggest that the temple served as a kind of pantheon for the Roman garrison. Its main nave is flanked by two lines of Corinthian columns that carry a window to a story. The temple floor was raised at a later date presumably to address a flooding issue caused by the proximity of the temple to the riverbank. It is rectangular in plan, 60 by 25 feet, with a semicircular apse on the west end. There is no evidence that the temple was ever used for early Christian worship. Wheeler also mentions the Basilica in Londonum in his commentary on Roman basilicas. The Basilica on Cornhill dates to after Boudicca's revolt in AD 60-61. It was an impressive 500 feet long. By contrast the Basilica Alpia in Rome was only 40 feet longer. The town's cardo led up from London Bridge and the river, and terminated at this basilica. It was entirely made of brick, and was accessed by a double archway at the centre of the southern long side. Like the basilica in Kerwent. In plan the basilica had three aisles. The first one merged with the vestibule to form a kind of entrance foyer. One accessed the central aisle by way of a row of twelve arches that probably once supported a clerestory. One left the central aisle by a mirroring line of twelve arches to access the eighteen offices along the back wall. We know from the excavations, that there was an apse on the eastern end of the nave, but given the overall symmetry of the plan, we might guess it was mirrored by another apse on the west side. In plan, the basilica is not unlike the Pompeian model, except that it probably had two apses instead of one, and it opens onto the forum along the long end, instead of the short. Wheeler calls this kind of basilica a Hadrianic model and says of a similar basilica at Kirine on page 114 that it is, in effect an enlarged stoa, and Greek influence is no doubt responsible. Like Lutetia, which lies under modern Paris, Rome and London lies under modern London, so Wheeler moves next to a ruined town that survives, Kerwent. The Roman town of Ventus Lurum, 
Near the modern town of Kerwent, lies midway between Gloucester to the east in England and Cardiff to the west in Wales, close to the estuary of the River Wye. At first glance, Kerwent resembles Tim Gad in North Africa, but Wheeler notes that unlike Tim Gad, which was founded as a colony for army veterans, Kerwent's primary function, he says on page 79, was to provide one of the centers of Romanization, whereby, as Tacitus in a famous passage tells us, the native tribesmen were subtly acclimatized to conquest and civilization. Therefore, although planned by military surveyors, it was intended as a civil, rather than a military town, or as Wheeler puts it on page 79, a tribal capital disguised in attractive Roman dress. Kerwent thus combines provincial casualness with typical Roman orderliness. The town was probably founded in the 1st century AD, and enclosed an area of approximately 45 acres. The oblong enclosure is bisected on an east-west axis by a highway, marked AA on the plan, which formed its decumanus maximus. There is no definite cardo. Instead, two minor cardines run off the forum at alternate corners to the north and south gates. The forum, marked B, is a provincial type, enclosed on all sides by arcade shops and a small shrine to the west, accessed from the decumanus maximus on the south side by means of an archway and dominated on the northern side by a Hadrianic-style basilica marked C, which is similar to but smaller than the Basilica in Londonum. To the east of the Forum, there was a small precinct reserved for a Romano-Celtic temple, marked E on the plan. Wheeler notes the alien form of this temple. The square cello was not raised on a podium, and it was accessed by a portico on all four sides. Just outside the town there was another Romano-Celtic temple, marked K on the plan. It was a polygonal cella, again without a podium, and accessed by an encircling portico. A similar phenomenon is found in the temple quarter of Trier in Gaul, evidence of Romano-Celtic religious fusion. There were three bath complexes in the town, the largest of which is located immediately south of the Forum. Tacitus mentions that baths were chief among the many seductions that coaxed tribal peoples into adopting the Roman way of life. F on the plan, is a shoddy amphitheater that was built later within the northern fringe of the town. Houses in Kerwent, generally followed classical prototypes, with small atriums. A rather irregular building near the south gate, marked J on the plan, was probably a tabernacle and brothel. The original settlement was fortified with two simple concentric defensive ditches, marked G and H on the plan. Later these crude fortifications were reinforced by the addition of a stone wall with polygonal watchtowers. Probably towards the end of the 2nd century AD, Kerwent represents a self-consciously Roman town on the northernmost frontier of the empire. That concludes Wheeler's commentary on Roman town planning in Gaul and Britain. Now, from the far north we jump to the far south, to North Africa, where we will examine the plans of Dugger, Timgad and Lepkis Magna.